So up to this point, we integrated both the pouch project and our taco project together, and I demonstrated it on my device. I'm seeing also that it's not that nice looking. So what we will do is deal with a little bit of styling. You should see that simply adding the pouch project into the taco project styled it pretty well overall, but not that table. It didn't know what you really wanted to do with the table. So we'll be writing some CSS. Let me pull this up again just to have something to look at. Classes. Uh, so if I show these classes, what I would like to do is to have the table stretch out to fill a reasonable amount of space. I think also with my particular color scheme, uh, it would be nice if the background of the cells were a different color. Maybe this heading as well so it stands out. And we're going to do something called zebra striping, where we're going to have alternating bands of color. Uh, that's very useful to display, to easily display much more readable content. Right now it's kind of a big wall of text. I want one row to be one color, the next row to be another color, the next row to be the same color, alternating back and forth. That is much easier to read, especially if we pick good color combinations. It's going to be much easier to read than that plain text. Now in our in our code, the way that table is built, if I go back to Notepad, it's inside of the Codeca file. That's a, uh, a dynamically generated table. So on the Codeca somewhere, mine is a line 135. This is where I where we started to build the table. We've got the start of the table, slash end of the table, and in between we, we create each row. We had the foresight to create the table and give it an ID, class table. That'll be an easier way for us to reference it via CSS or JavaScript, so that then we can style it. I'm going to copy that name, class table. Now we need to open up our CSS file. Back in your WW folder, open up Kodika external CSS in Notepad. I'll go to the bottom of my document. So make sure you're in the Kodika CSS file, not the JS file. Mine is only up to 81 lines. The JS one is 100 and something. And so that has an, that's an ID that we defined, the table, we gave it an ID early on, and here's a way then that we can style it. So we'll have pound class table, the same as it's spelled, of course. Uh, this way then we will be able to reference it, we will be able to style it. Uh, we've got our curly braces here. Hey, that's kind of like JSON format, isn't it? Now that you think about it, curly braces, key and value, background size and such. Not really, but it looks reminiscent, doesn't it? Um, so what we're going to do here is, uh, first I'm going to add these various um, properties to this selector. One is that I want to change its width to be 100%. I want it to stretch out to as much of the size that it appears on screen. It has an inherent background color, which it got from body and a variety of other factors in the cascade. And I want to then redefine a background color. I've got one that I like here, white smoke. That is a valid color. It's some shade of gray. I'm going to put a background color behind the whole table.
I will have margin auto. This is the way that we are able to automatically also center our table. Margin, remember, is the four sides of the table, top, right, bottom, left. But if we set left and right as auto, it should automatically center it to the screen. It's already filling up 100% of the width. But if we had it to say, let's say 90% of the width, it would be 90% wide and leaning to the left. If I want that table in the center, margin auto. Let's see what this looks like so far. Again, I'm not going to be able to simply run um, from Notepad. I need to do Taco Run Browser or Emulate or something. And probably Taco Run Browser will be the fastest. Make sure your files are saved. We were dealing with three different files, the HTML, the JavaScript, and the CSS. So you might want to hit that Save All button. I'm probably not going to run it after every change because it does take a little bit on mine. My classes, show classes, it should have remembered what you had there. That's the whole point of pouch, so I did show classes. Okay, so the table is stretching out nicely to my full width. It's got a little bit inherent of size or padding on the side because of jQuery Mobile. There's that white smoke. It's not exactly white. It's a little bit off-white. I can choose any colors I want, of course, but this is one off the top of my head. Um, as we add content to our table, we have to think about what happens once we're adding content that takes up a lot of space. Here, I've just put some gibberish, but if it, if it was an instructor's long name or a class long name, depending how the person typed it, I typed a little bit of stuff with some space, and it kind of was smart enough to do a little word wrap. However, word wrap fails when I have a long bit of text not broken up by spaces. We can do some force word wrap. We can force word wrap so that it doesn't go off the end of the page. That could happen. You see here if I put in just a bunch of non-breaking text, it'll gladly take that and show it, and then my table gets weird. That it's going off the edge of my page. Very unprofessional. Well, we have a little bit of CSS to deal with that. So I wrote something, obviously, that doesn't quite fit to, to show you here. Uh, I'll go back to the CSS. We've got width, background, color, and margin. We'll add another property here. We need to add uh, a, little, uh, a few different CSS uh, rules here in order for this to fully work. So we will add uh, table-layout fixed. We will add text-wrap normal. And then we'll add word dash wrap break dash word. If something needs to be broken, if a word needs to be broken, it will be broken going on to its next line. Uh, we want to make sure we've also got our regular text wrap turned on just in case. And uh, table layout fixed helps us also to help us break things up. So this, of course, depends on the device that it's on. Uh, on my browser, I could see that it, if that it needed it. Then on my device, it seemed like it too. If it's, if it's on a tablet, it'll probably fit nicely. And so that's what, what happens when we deal with a variety of, of devices. Show classes. Now look at that. So it's not going off the edge of the page anymore in a weird way. It is visible on screen in a weird way. So there's no perfect way to handle this. But here now it doesn't make it look like it's falling out of the, 
out of the page. Okay, what I also want to do is uh, style the different elements throughout my document. Uh, the very first row is a table heading. It's a TH. I would like that to be a little bit of a different color. Go back to our code. We're referencing the whole table itself with the CSS. Each individual element within the table has a tag, of course, um, that we can use the, the built-in tags. We didn't set anything to classes or IDs that might be overkill, so we'll use the built-in tags here. So I could create a TH. I could say, let's redefine the table headings. That very first row is a TH. This, however, is too much of a, a blunt instrument. This will apply to every table heading anywhere in our project. I want only the table headings of this table. So I'm going to back up and instead write class table space th. Notice how my my code here changes. If it doesn't look exactly like that, you've got a mistake. It should look like that. Or if you change your style, it should look different. Here I'm saying, OK, there's going to be a table on screen specifically the heading of that table. So make sure there's a space there. So now this will only target THs of this table. And what I can do here is uh, I, I need to figure out some colors later on, but for the moment, background color, uh, let's say purple so it's obvious. I already know that I'm going to need a color for the text. Remember our contrasts. Black text on white background is very visible. Good contrast. Here I'm adding a dark color, purple, and I had not redefined my text color. So now I've got a dark foreground on a dark background. That'd be hard to read. So very simply here, light foreground on a dark background. These might not be the best colors, but we're setting ourselves up here uh, to be able to style it nicely at, at your leisure, at your choosing, with your choosing. There we go, so I'm getting that first row again. Purple doesn't really match well with the rest of my design. I can go look up what my color codes are. But now that, uh, that first heading there, th, th has been styled. Okay, so then I'd like to do zebra striping, where alternating colors, rows of colors, make my table a little easier to read. Next line. Again, we're targeting just this particular table. So we have to first say, dealing with this table, now what we're going to do is deal with the table rows. If I were to simply write my code this way, this would affect every row of this table. I want to use this pseudo selector to have it select alternating rows for me. This is built into CSS. It's probably CSS3. It might be CSS2. But here's a way for us to then kind of specify alternating rows. So we'll say class table space tr, then colon, there's no space between the tr and the colon, and then no space here further, nth dash of dash type 
open close parentheses, nth type, table row, nth of type. And within the parentheses, we'll say odd. We'll say here basically the odd numbered rows of this table. Let's focus on them. I will add a background color. We'll do this trick instead of a uh, defined color. We will define it via RGB values. So we will specify RGB parentheses. We'll put in a color formula here. Let's try 0, 50, 200. And so if I've got my uh, hexadecimal color formula or my RGB color formula, I can um, specify it via this way. This would be more accurate because purple probably wouldn't be the perfect purple of my brand, but writing it via its formula this way should be. Got to pick a better color, but there's my concept. Uh, I've got one color alternating with another color, so I should have added also color white. Again, light on dark, good contrast. Dark on dark, not good contrast. So here I should have added as well color white. Now I'm specifying the odd rows. So uh, odd, even, odd, even, odd, even. If I add another item, it makes a new row, which is another odd row. It goes with the blue. So if we're doing odd rows, yes, we also have even rows. If I want to then define the color of the even rows, it's pretty much the same sort of code with a little change. So class table tr curly braces the pseudo selector nth of type parentheses, this time even we have odd, we have even, we probably have a few other ones but these uh, these make sense here this time, so I don't forget, I'll put color, I'll put the color of white first. Background color. Now here's another trick. Uh, I had to find RGB. And in order for the zebra striping to really work, I should have good color harmonies. Let's say I don't really know color harmony, I just know what looks good. And here's a trick that we can achieve this. We've chosen a version of blue on line 93. I can use the same version of that blue, but make it more transparent, so that it's a lighter version of my existent color. And I can do that via transparency RGBA, A for alpha. Up here I'm defining the components red, green, blue of a color. And here we're defining red, green, red, green, blue, and alpha. I believe we've mentioned this briefly a while ago. But RGBA lets us define transparency. So I'm going to use the same color, 0, comma, 50, comma, 200, and then comma, the fourth attribute here, is uh, transparency from 0 to 1, which is, you know, 1 or 0 to 100%. So if I were to put a 1 right here, that would be the exact same color as line 93. 
it's 100% strong. So if I put the, the, the leading zero is optional, but I like to put it in to remind me it's a fraction, 0 0.5, then that's 50% strong. And then any value from 0 0.1, I suppose from 0 0.01 all the way up to 0 0.99. But you'll probably want to go 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.7, that sort of whole number. Tenths. So the purpose of this is I'm starting with a with a base color RGB, and then I'm using a weaker version of the color, which will give me some color harmony. If I'm not very well versed in color theory and such, Now in our particular app, we have locked it so that it stays in portrait orientation. But here, because I'm testing it in the browser, I have the icon on top here to rotate. You'll see that it also stretches out there, so that's if it's a larger device. I want to see what that looks like on my real device because you don't get the full picture of what it really looks like on a device until you actually test it on one, of course. So let's do a little pause here. Did everyone uh, get that to work? Did you get your colors and such working on that table? Yes. You know what? I don't believe there is an easy way to select by columns. There's no element. There's no tag for columns. It's all based on rows. Well, what I was getting at, one way to possibly select by a columns is to add classes. Build a class into a column, and then you're able to style it. Yeah, I'm seeing it's got a little bit too much space. We we have a class there, uh, except for the heading up on top. Maybe we could play with that a bit. Um, let me remind me here. We've got in our in our JS we have a class of edit pencil. So in theory, we should be able to write some some code here maybe to tighten up that space. Let's see. I would 
most likely defined table first, then that particular class, class is the dot, Or it's something like this. What if we try to put 10% of a width there? So this is there is no built-in element to, to target a column, but perhaps because we've got a class. Now we don't have that class on the very first th. Maybe we should add that first. Tables uh, tables don't quite behave like one thinks, especially with the content inside of it. So there the content inside of the last column is very small, but it's still taking up like a quarter. There's four columns, so it's, I feel like it's giving it one quarter of the size of everything. And in, the same, the same width up here. Yes, but if we change that width, I don't think that would still affect this column here it's within the table it has its own size and parameters and such now instead of trying to guess blindly we might as well use the element inspector as I am seeing there it doesn't seem to be doing anything with width So there is, of course, a way to, to fix that. We just might need to play with the CSS a bit. I'm going to try one or two more things, and we'll see if we can tighten up that space. The table um, itself has the ability that we can put widths into it, but it should be styled a little bit better via CSS. This might be better here. I'll show you what I did. So this seems to be better. Um, that column now is a lot tighter. So this text here doesn't look so weird. Here's what I did to, to fix this. First, I went up to back to my Kodika JS file to about line 136. we have td class edit pencil to our pencil icon. So we have a starting point to, to try to style that column. But this is only being added to every cell below the heading, the th. So on line 136, we have an empty space. We've got th with an empty space. So I added th class edit pencil, the same class that I've got for the actual TD, for the actual cell where the pencil is shown. I added the heading, I added to the heading the same class, edit pencil. So now I have a way to style that whole column, since there's no built-in tag that I can manipulate. I'm going to save the HTML file, and then back on my CSS file, I built, or I wrote, uh, specifying on the class table ID, dot edit pencil, because it's a class. I've got the th and every subsequent td below it. And I simply said, well, let's make give that whole cell and whole column 10%. If 
if the element needs 12% of space, it will override that and take up the space that it needs. It's not going to shrink your element further. It's going to be at least the size of your element. So that might be too small, too big, but uh, via 10% seems to have done it. So it's a class, of course, so make sure this is dot .edit pencil from the HTML file. I saved both, the HTML file, the CSS file. And then when I compiled it, it's showing it as better spacing. So can you speak up a little bit? So you're saying you don't see the edit pencil? No, I see it's fine. I see what I expect to see. I'm just saying that maybe they ask the question, I'll have to be specific. I don't see it as being a See, for example, instead of using white, I use green, now I got green and I got a green and I got a row, but it's all the, like, all the elements of that color. That's why I'm skewing it for the Well, because we've uh, s specified this new one right here, only then to the bedded pencil, now I can target that and change its CSS. That's what I was That it's too wide? It's still showing the previous result that it's too wide? Too wide. It doesn't take the risk 10%. And I also noticed previously that I changed the color. It also, the, no matter I reload or like the reload or something, it will pick up. And then later on, probably some time past, then it will pick up. But for now, it's like I already changed the risk. <laughs> Now, make sure it didn't do it for me originally until I added the class yeah. there. So you're yeah. sure you've got the class? You're sure you saved all your files? I saved it. I think it's happening to me. There's like a lag. I did it exactly. Very simple changes to background color. Mm -hmm. And it did it take the first time I did it. Yeah. So close like the browser, go back in a couple of times. Like, yeah, like there's a lag. If you use the uh, incognito, like yeah. the, all the data is gone. I mean, it seems like the, uh, the data is gone. Yes, if you go into incognito, it's different. It's technically a different sandbox, mm -hmm. and so whatever data I have saved here will not. If you use another browser, it shows up the updating result, but the all the data. Is yeah, but it doesn't even matter to show another browser because that other browser is not going to run the Cordova JS file. The Cordova JS file doesn't exist until we compile it. Uh, so I wouldn't try to run it in any other browser. Most of it will not work. We have to do the Taco Run browser, which will only open Chrome. And if we run it in incognito, I still wouldn't run it in incognito anyway because doing Taco Run browser opens it as a regular browser. So you're kind of finding these mistakes that I would not worry about at all because we're not going to be in incognito mode ever. We're not going to run it in Firefox ever because we're running it via Taco Browser, which is Chrome. Now we are seeing some of these weird edges, but again, these are so edge case scenarios that I would not worry about at all to further test it on devices. Now it is odd to me that these things are not happening as soon as you test them. I don't know what to say about that. Um, all of mine are working, but that's not a good answer. I don't know. It's just that um, I would not refresh this either. That doesn't seem to really do 
what it's supposed to either. See, it's like confused there. So I don't know. I would completely close the browser, run it again, and I don't have much to say about why it's not current. Has anyone else seen that? That there's a lag, like an old version that doesn't load up right away? So, beta testing. That's what we're doing. We're doing alpha testing. So I'm testing it on my browser, I'm testing it on my device, it seems to be behaving how I want. What I still want to work on is um, this, this update system works, but with a little bit of CSS I can make it look a little nicer. Um, we've got the update button and those three boxes, those three input fields. We're going to write a little CSS to kind of align things up a little nicer. Uh, we'll also go in and add some extra functionality about uh, the database itself. After we finish styling it a bit, we'll go back and add functionality furthermore to the database. What if a person wants to start over completely? They've saved all of these classes, but they just want to start all over. They don't want these classes anymore. They could obviously delete them individually. But I don't want to delete 10 classes. I want to start over. Well, Pouch gives us the ability to delete the database completely and start over. So we'll get to that after our final styling here. But what I'm saying is I want to style this a little bit. It looks a little jumbled up. So my idea is I want to divide this into columns. Uh, the left column will have the update button, and the right column will have the three fields nicely lined up. That would be a little CSS. I need to set myself up first, because my idea is that I'm going to make two columns, left column, right column. I can do that in a variety of ways. We'll do it via divs. We'll use some div tags to divide up that little section there into two columns. Let's go back to our code. Let's go back to our JavaScript code. Line 148 is where our update elements are at. We've got um, the button, there's the update button, then there's the three input fields. What I want to do here is break this up into two columns. Um, let me draw a little picture here about what we're about to do conceptually. And then we'll write the code. What we want to do is... <coughs> we want to have a left column, we want to have a right column, whatever size. Um, we are first going to wrap a bigger div around all of that so that it's a self so that it's a contained unit so that we can style it and align it and all of that. We'll have one div on the outside, a div on the left side, and a div on the right side. The left div will have the the button. And then the right div will have the uh, input fields. So in order for us to get that sort of visual setup, we'll use three divs. One to wrap everything, and then one to define a left and right column. So here, on line 148, first I'll start with the div that is on the outside of it all. So starting at the very beginning of that, of that string, I'll start div. the very end of the string before the end of the quote, the double quote, will close the div slash div. We need to go back then and add either a class or an ID so that we can target it via CSS. But first here just kind of backing up. The div ends right there. Div starts right there. backing up to the beginning. <coughs> I may want to do this more than once, creating columns. So class, oops, single quotes there, class, so that we can reuse it. Be careful here, I did it on accident, but I remembered single quotes because we've got the double quotes wrapping the whole string. 
call this div to call. This is our class where we're setting up two columns. My picture showed that I want the button to be on the left column. That needed its own div. So I'm going to create another div after the two call div. I'll start a new div and wrap that around only the button. So you should see in the string we've got div for the whole two column setup. After that, we will add another div and finish that right after the button. We'll give that a class. We'll call this one div oops, single quotes left call simple quotes there, be careful and that's the left column that only encompasses the button and I'll do something very very similar for my right column I'll start my div where my first input box starts and then I'll finish my div where the last input box ends Let's see, we've got our button, and then our input field starts there, and then our div closes there. So we'll start, a, start another div. I'll go to the end of my code. Before the end of that div, that's the whole container. Before the end of that one, we need another end. So this div here is only the right column, and it needs a class. We've got our div class left call, then we'll have div, <coughs> then we'll have class div right call. Div right call. I'm going to save that JS file. Visually, nothing will change. We're just defining these empty containers. These divs have no inherent um, visual style. They're pretty generic. So that means via CSS, we need to define what they look like. dot div to call dot uh, div left call and dot div right call
the outermost div to call. We're going to define it so that it spreads out to take up the space that's there. Um, also to center it on screen. Then we're going to define a left column that takes up a certain amount of space, like maybe 20-25% of the space, because more space is needed for the input boxes. The button itself doesn't take up that much space, so horizontally maybe only about 20% of the space. Therefore about 80% of the space is then going to be used for the, um, the right column where the input fields are actually at. So div to call, that'll have a width. Um, I'll do 95% just so that it doesn't isn't as wide as the things before it. The things before it all take up to 100%. I'm making these a little bit smaller just to offset them a little bit. In design principles, uh, one of the design principles is um, alignment. When things are aligned together, they have a meaning. This alignment here is going to be a little bit different than other alignments, so these units here will be will have a meaning together. Margin auto, so that it's centered. If we didn't put margin auto, it would still work, but it would be leaning to the left. It would be 95% of the size and it would lean to the left, which might be fine. You may want that or not. The left column, then, we will add a width of 20%. Now this is going to be 20% of the size within the container of div to call. That's spreading out to 95% itself. So this will be 20% of the space inside of that. Um, we'll add float left. This is a property to let us line things up in one block. The default would be that the left column will want to take up as much space on one block and then push the right column to its next line. So it would defeat the purpose of having left and right columns. With float left, we're forcing this element to stay to the left of this one block. The next one, div right column, will do something similar so that they all stay in one row. We'll do that one with 80%. It has to, or it should add up as best as possible to 100%. And then also float left. That'll keep it on the same. You might think, well, why not float right? One's on the left, one's on the right. It doesn't work that way. We're doing float left on both so that they stay within the same row, the same block. We might have to uh, play with a couple of other percentages and such, but at this point, let's see how that, how that works. Run it in your browser or device. So what we've got here is this concept. You've got that outer div, the left and the right, different sizes. close. These things seem to be overlapping, but now the point is it wasn't jumbled up like before. Let's see, here's my old version of it. It's kind of jumbled up in an odd way. The new version is there. There's a delineation between left and right columns, uh, so we might play with the padding a little bit, maybe the percentages. I have actually a padding left that we can add. So what I, I have an answer, of course, but what I mean by playing with it is I would I could go back to my element uh, inspector and figure out, well, if I kind of play around with what's here, 
maybe add some padding left with some values. Yes. So we're seeing here, I'm trying to add some space to the left, but then now it's 80% plus 20% 5%, 105%. 105%. So here, that's why it's pushing over. So if I take 5% away from that, this is what I'm saying about playing with this, because conceptually I want to do something like this, some space, and I start to change these things and I figure out, well, I need to account for all of these little factors. CSS, a while ago, remember I said HTML is the relatively easy one. CSS is a little harder. JavaScript is the hardest one. So little nuances like this um, are, are what you might notice. So based on that, my, our, my code will most likely be, and you can decide your own values here, but based on what I saw, it looked like 75% width of the right column and then a uh, padding left of 5%. Maybe a little more padding, so 10% left, and then I'd have to change its width to 70% so that it all adds up to 100. You've got this 20 plus this 75 plus this 5. Repeat that. Yes, exactly. It's all based on this one. So okay, so twenty seven five and five is hundred percent Yes. Yeah, the larger div two column. Whatever that is, the ones that up to 100 down there add up to the div to column. So that'll give you a little bit of space. If you want more, you, you do the math. So um, I think overall that's good. Uh, We'll do a little break up to this point to make sure everything's working. Uh, and then after the break, what we'll do is what I'm saying about, I would like to start start fresh. I could go in and delete these individually, or I want to delete all of them to have a brand new database to work with. That will require we go look up, well, how do you delete a database in Pouch? And then implement it into our project, some way to do it. Maybe a little bit of a, a user confirmation, because what we're about to do is delete the whole database. There's no way to bring it back very easily without, of course, further programming a backup and all of that. So we will have the user say, are you sure? To fully confirm, and then we'll delete the database to be able to start over. So it's, it's about 8. We'll take a 10-minute break. We'll be back at 8.10. I'll put a copy of my code in the folder, and then we'll, we'll get going.